Welcome to Marsfield Community Church. It's great to have you joining with us this morning. My name's Kate, and I wanted to start our time together by reading a psalm. I don't know what your week has been like, what your weekend has been like up until now, uh, but it's good to be reminded that no matter how we're feeling, God is worthy of our praise and worship. So here are the words of Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. We're going to sing together and praise this great God of ours. And then it will be time for the children to come a little bit closer for the kids talk. So if you'd like to join in with us, please stand and sing. Beep, beep. <laughs> 
Hi everyone, I'm Matt. And I'm Agent Scruff, 007. Right, and what's with the hair? I'm a secret agent. I need to blend in. <laughs> right. And Cedric and I have nearly finished our mission. Your mission? Yeah, to make the biggest and best chalk-coated bone in the whole wide world. <laughs> Scruff, that started 10 weeks ago. I know, but, but we're nearly finished. See ya! Right, well, while Scruff may have spent the last 10 weeks making a chalk-coated bone, we have been looking at the awesome book of Acts. And Acts is all about Jesus' mission. Jesus' mission is that people from all around the world would hear that Jesus is the king and that people from all around the world would accept Jesus as their king. Well, today we get to the end of the book of Acts. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter 16 all the way through to chapter 28. And we're going to see that, do it with me, the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Let's watch. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> Paul and Silas were chained in the innermost cell of the jail. They looked at each other and they sang. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sin. How did they get here, you ask? Let's go back and see. Paul and his companions returned from Jerusalem to Antioch with the news. Everyone can be made right with God just by repenting and accepting Jesus as their king. All the church was so happy. Yay! Yay! We're so happy! Paul and his companions were then sent on their way by the church in Antioch. Okay, okay, then. Then. To go and spread the news. Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. He started by returning to places he visited on his first journey. Places like Lystra and Pisidian Antioch. And then he kept going and going until he arrived in Philippi. In Philippi, Paul met a woman named Lydia. Lydia, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. Yes! I will repent and accept Jesus as my king. Paul then healed a slave girl who had been possessed by a demon. Demon? In the name of the risen king Jesus, I command you to come out of her! I'm free! But for this good deed... Paul and Silas were arrested. Oi, you're under arrest. And they were thrown in prison and put in chains. <laughs> you're not going anywhere. <laughs> Paul and Silas were chained in the innermost cell of the jail. They looked at each other and they sang. Repent and be baptised, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. But that night, while Paul and Silas sang, God sent a violent earthquake to shake the prison, and all the doors flew open, and all the chains fell off all the prisoners. When the jailer woke up, he thought, Yikes, I'm in big trouble. But Paul called out, It's okay, we're all still here. When the jailer saw this, he fell to his knees and yelled, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Yes, I do believe in the Lord Jesus. Paul and his companions then left Philippi and continued on their journey, proclaiming, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. Eventually, Paul arrived in Athens. Athens was famous for its deep thinkers. Oh, that's very deep. In Athens, Paul told everyone, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. Some people thought this was a ridiculous message. That's ridiculous. Dead people don't come alive again. He's a babbler. But some people believed. Yes, we, we believe. believe. I accept Jesus as my king. Tell us, tell us more, more, tell us more. more. Paul and his companions then continued on their journey, proclaiming, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. Until they arrived back home in Antioch. Then Paul and his companions were sent off on another journey. Off you go then. To keep spreading the news. Jesus is the risen king. 
Repent and accept Jesus as your king. They went back to a number of places they had been to before and came back to Ephesus. Now Ephesus was famous for the temple of the goddess Artemis. This temple was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. Wow, that's one impressive building. Sure is. But when Paul was in Ephesus, he told people, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. And many believed. Yes, yes we, repent. we repent. I accept, I accept Jesus, Jesus as, as my king. king. But many others did not like this message, and they started a riot. Boo! Boo! We already Boo! have our own God! Artemis! 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 Eventually, the riot quietened down. Maybe we should go home now. Yeah, good idea. And so Paul and his companions set off again, going to new and old places, always telling people the same message. Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. Eventually, Paul and his companions made it back to Jerusalem. But before Paul could return home again to Antioch, a riot broke out. And Paul was arrested. Right. You're under arrest. Over the next few years, Paul was kept locked up until he was sent to the capital of the Roman Empire. Even though you have done nothing wrong, you must go to Rome and stand trial before Caesar. And so Paul was bound and put on a ship for the long journey to Rome. But on that journey, a huge storm struck. The boat was tossed and turned all over the Mediterranean Sea. No one knew which way they were going. Oh, where are we going? Where are we going? Everyone thought this was the end. This is the end! But it wasn't. The ship ran aground. We, we struck sand. sand! And the boat was wrecked. The ship's coming aboard! Jump overboard! Jump overboard! Jump swim! But everyone washed up safe and sound on an island called Malta. Yay! We're, We're safe. Safe. safe! But then Paul was bitten by a venomous snake. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. But God still had plans for Paul. And so he lived. Whoa! whoa. He's still, He's alive. still alive. alive! God must have plans for him. After a few months on the island of Malta, Paul and those with him were put back on a boat. And they sailed across to Italy and travelled until they came to Rome. Paul had now made it to the capital of the Roman Empire. And while he may have still been in chains, Paul kept proclaiming, Jesus is the risen king. Repent and accept Jesus as your king. The end. Over the last 10 weeks, we've been looking at Jesus' mission that people all around the world would hear that Jesus is the king and that people all around the world would accept Jesus as their king. Well, by the end of Acts, Jesus' mission has spread to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, throughout the Middle East and into Europe, and it has made its way all the way to Rome. But all of this is just a tiny part of the world. But Jesus' mission didn't stop at the end of Acts because there are now people who have Jesus as their king, well, here in Australia and in New Zealand and in Peru and in Vanuatu and in Ethiopia and in England and in America. In fact, there are now people who have Jesus as their king all around the world. And Jesus' mission still hasn't stopped because Jesus wants everyone to know about him. And so kids, that means you can be involved in Jesus' mission by telling your friends and your neighbours of the risen King Jesus. And as you do, you can know that, do it with me, the mission of the risen King Jesus cannot be stopped. Okay, Matt, we've done it! What, you completed your mission? We sure did! Check it out! Oh. Whoa, that's huge! Yes, I am awesome agent! Scruff 007! Scruff, you okay? We'll be 
okay. <laughs> Let's all be involved in Jesus' unstoppable mission by telling people of the risen King Jesus. See you next time. Okay, guys, I've got a few things I'd like to let you know about. Uh, first thing, though, we would love to know that you have joined us today. So if you can click uh, the communication card link that should be coming up in the chat right now and fill that out for you and anyone else who's watching there with you today. We understand some people are watching in small groups in their homes, which is great. So if you can fill that out. But especially if you're new, we would love to have your contact details and hear anything you'd like to tell us, whether that's some feedback, something we can pray for you for, uh, or anything else you'd like to say. That's your way that you can communicate with us. Uh, secondly, we have our church AGM, our annual general meeting, coming up on the 9th of August. So that's two Sundays time. Uh, it's going to be at 11.30 a.m., so just after the 10 a.m. service finishes, uh, and that will be via Zoom. Now, the link for that has already been sent out. So if you haven't received it, uh, you need to let us know, but hopefully you have. Uh, and the voting instructions will be sent out in an email this week coming. So that's the instructions for how to vote on uh, the members of the LT, the leadership team that will happen at that meeting. Uh, so stay tuned for that email as well. The next thing is that we have Flourish, our quarterly women's get together happening uh, next Saturday, the 1st of August. So a little bit less than one week to go. Now, a few updates on this that I'd love to tell you about. Instead of just running one session of Flourish in the afternoon at two o'clock, because we're going online, we've got the opportunity to vary it up a little bit. So we're going to have two sessions uh, which are run in small groups. So there will be small groups in people's homes around the place meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon. There'll also be some groups meeting in people's homes at 7.30 at night. There's a third option as well. We've heard from some people that they're not able or comfortable to meet in person at this point, but they would still love to participate. So you can either join us online, so watching together at the 7.30 time slot and then join a Zoom group for the discussion groups afterwards, uh, or you can just let us know you wanna watch it online on your own time uh, and we can give you the details so that you can do that. So please do RSVP and let us know which option you would like. You would have received an email last week. If you need that sent out again, let me know uh, because we do need RSVPs by Wednesday so we can organise everyone's groups and sort people into things. So by Wednesday, you should hear if you've RSVP'd yes, we'll let you know where you're going, where the, who, whose house it is, where the house is and their contact details uh, and a bit of other information you might be wondering. So please do come along if you can, it will be great. Uh, now, we've got a really special announcement uh, from Tim and Jess, so we're going to cut to them and hear what they have to say. Hey everyone, we just wanted to introduce you to someone super special. We want to introduce you to our son. Sambo, can you tell us what his name is? What's baby's name? Baby Luke. Baby Luke. Baby Luke was born last Sunday on the 19th of July and... Um, yeah, we're loving having him in our family and we wanted to show him to you. Isn't it exciting to hear about the birth of little Luke? Uh, how about I pray just quickly for the Boneses uh, and thanking God for Luke's arrival. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much uh, for the gift of new life. We thank you for Luke Bones. Thank you for his safe arrival. And we just pray for Tim and Jess and Sammy as they adjust to having an extra member in their family. Lord, we pray uh, that you would help them to work out what family life uh, is going to look like from now on. Lord, we pray especially that Sammy would adjust to having a little brother. Lord, we pray that you would keep all of them in good health uh, and help them to keep uh, being patient and loving towards each other, even when things are full on, uh, when they're feeling really tired uh, and when things are still pretty new. So Lord, we do ask that you would hold them close to you at this time and help us 
to continue being prayerful for them uh, in this next few weeks as well. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to get your Bibles out now, uh, Andrew is going to bring us our first Bible reading and then Willard is going to come and pray. Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Andrew and uh, I'm going to read the Bible now. Would you turn your Bibles now to Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 30. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? Is it like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth? Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that birds can perch in its shade. Good morning, everyone. It's great to have you here with us this morning. Today, I'm going to start my prayer around chapter 2 of Daniel, which we just heard from Andrew. And then I'll pray about the virus situation and for our world. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the rock on which we stand and the stone who will finally prevail over all worldly kingdoms. Keep us ever looking to him and trusting him in every area of our lives and keep us prepared for his return. When the enemy comes in like a flood in our personal lives, or sneaks into our work lives, or invades our relationships, we praise and thank you that you are our standard. Arm us and fight for us, protect us and provide for all our needs according to your riches in glory. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For you alone are worthy and yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Lord, Thank you for telling us the end from the beginning and preparing the ultimate sacrifice to save us from our sin. Thank you that a day is coming when you will bring to nothing the evilness of Satan that has enslaved this world, that has rejected your offer of salvation and put on a necklace of rebellion and pride. Keep us focused on wisdom through Jesus. Increase our understanding. Help us to pray with passion and give us the willingness to learn and to seek your guidance. Thank you that you have revealed your purpose and plan through the prophetic writings of Daniel and chosen others through your words. Despite the ambitions of men, your kingdom will never end. Open the eyes of those who have been blinded by worldly attractions, which are all distractions, and bring many into your kingdom, we pray, before it is too late. Lord, As we have watched the world get ravaged by this virus, the reality of the threat for us here in this country becomes a growing concern. For those who are fearful, give us the joy and comfort of knowing you. Give us peace despite the anxiety, the frustration and the isolation. Everything that passes is by your will. It has now been four months since we have met physically together but we have unity in spirit under one king whose kingdom never ends. This tiny virus has spread out into the world, crippling it, but your kingdom began like a tiny mustard seed and spread out through the world to save it. Help us to hold dearly onto this promised hope of heaven. Lord, with the virus dominating our news and lives, Help us look at this world in which we live and realise that the field to plough is almost overwhelming. Help us be the seed that falls on good soil, to understand your word, to grow in knowledge and produce a large crop. For those who make big decisions in the world, may they seek wise counsel. We pray for areas of war, conflict, tension, famine and oppression. In Africa, in North Korea, in China, in Syria and Palestine and Israel, and for all the minority groups under persecution that don't make the news. May peace in your name and your glory be sought in all these places. May the Christians who are in positions of power use their influence for a loving and godly purpose. We pray for the decision makers of this country and in this world, that the truth from your word will not be watered down, distorted, misused or suppressed. We pray for the decisions that we make in our own lives, that we will stand firm in the gospel 
and be a shining light to those around us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn your Bibles now to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll... We will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me the gifts and rewards and great honour. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Once more they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream, and he will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time, because you realise that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping the situation will change. So then, tell me the dream, and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, There is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and then were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. Then Ariok, the commander of the king's guards, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon. Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Aria then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. He urged them, plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise to be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and a knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, God, of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we asked of you, and you have made known us the king, the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to them, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Ariok took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among the exiles of Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshah, Are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel said, no wise man, enchanter, magician or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He's known, he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as they were lying in bed are these. 
As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else alive, but so your majesty may know the interpretation that you may understand and went through your mind. Your majesty looked, and there before stood a large statue, an enormous dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While they were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It stuck, struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron of the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff, a freshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream, and now we interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Whenever they live, he has made the ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, the third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for the iron breaks and smashes everything. And the iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be divided, a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united anymore that iron mixes with clay. In the time of the kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will its, itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold into pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, its interpretation is trustworthy. The king Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in high position, lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all the wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. I am a little bit of a news junkie, always reading newspapers uh, online and what's happening and what various journalists say. But what I've noticed in the last few weeks with this whole COVID-19 coronavirus thing I start reading articles by journalists about what could happen in the future, and five minutes in I realise, wait a minute, this journo doesn't know anything more about what's happening than I do. Why? Because no one seems to know what will happen or what's going on. If you're a follower of Jesus, you actually believe that God is the one who knows what's going on and knows where things are going. And Jesus teaches, if you can see what it is that God's doing, it changes everything in the way you see the world. 
Well, Daniel chapter 2 is actually about God revealing to Daniel and, well, to Nebuchadnezzar and to us about the long game, about his plans for our world and what he's doing. Uh, it's fascinating. Let, let's have a look and you'll see how it's two and a half thousand years old and yet it tells us today what it is that we should be focusing on, what really matters. So in, we're up to Daniel chapter 2. Uh, in Daniel chapter 1, we, under, we, we get the story of how Daniel and his three friends are taken out of Jerusalem when the Babylonians conquer in 605 and they're brought to Babylon and they do a kind of a, an internship where they're recruited to serve the king. But you get to Daniel chapter 2, verse 1, is just a little bit later than that. Daniel 2, 1. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. Um, it's likely that this event happens during the internship or scholarship that Daniel and his three friends have. Likely around 603 BC, and Nebuchadnezzar is dreaming and he's troubled. Why? It's still early in his reign. He's still, the scholars tell me, he's still, there are wars and battles happening on the edges of his empire. His power is not yet consolidated. He's a troubled man. And so he has this dream. And then uh, verse two, so the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants a dream and we will interpret it. Now this is just uh, another day at work for these guys. They had dream manuals and you dream about a particular thing and they would look it up and tell you, okay, you dreamed about you know, a dog or a cow or whatever and here's what it means. Except the king, uh, this is no ordinary day at work. Verse 5, the king replied to the astrologers, this is what I've firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turn into piles of rubble. But if you tell me uh, the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards and great honour. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Uh, now, it's possible that he can't remember it, but I think it's more likely that this is a real test for the astrologers and magicians. Can they really interpret dreams? Well, if they can tell him what the dream was, you can trust their interpretation. If you read on through the story, the astrologers squeal, and rightly so, and say, no man can do this. It's what you ask is impossible. Now, Nebuchadnezzar gets angry and decides that he will then kill all the wise men, uh, etc., in Babylon. Uh, when they talked about cutting heads in the Babylon civil service, uh, they really meant it. So Daniel uh, and his three friends are in this scholarship thing at the time, and so they're caught up in the whole execute all the wise men. The story goes on to tell us Daniel gets the news about the planned executions. Daniel has the opportunity to somehow ask the king for, an, uh, for a stay of execution overnight uh, so that he can ask God uh, to explain the dream. They, Daniel and his three friends plead uh, with the God of heaven for mercy and God reveals the dream to Daniel. And so see verse 19. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven. Daniel goes back to the king who asks him, verse 26, the king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar. Uh, Belteshazzar is the Babylonian name that Daniel was given. Also called Belteshazzar, the king asked, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And then Daniel says, well, it's the God of heaven who has explained this. And then we hear the dream, verse 31. Your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an, enor an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue is made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. And then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were all broken to pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue 
became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, very interesting. That's the dream, the statue, the rock, etc. But what does it mean? Well, Daniel goes on to explain. You see verse 36. This was the dream and now we will interpret it to the king. Verse 37. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power, might and glory. In your hands he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, wherever they live. He has made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. Verse 39. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. 41. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. 42. As the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. Verse 44. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. Verse 45, the great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. So there's the the dream and the interpretation. Did Daniel get it right? Well, here's an artist's impression of of what happened then. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar bowing down to Daniel. Um, My guess is it was a kind of slightly awkward moment of the greatest king on earth bowing down to a teenager Uh, But we're told, verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honour and ordered him an offering, uh, sorry, ordered that an offering, an incense, be presented to him. 47, The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Verse 49. Moreover, at Daniel's request, actually what we see in 49 is Daniel remembering his mates. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. Now, incidentally, Uh, You look at 49, that might explain why Daniel is absent in chapter 3 in the uh, chapter about the giant statue and the the furnace uh, and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Uh, That happens in the province of Babylon and it looks like Daniel is working somewhere else. So why isn't Daniel mentioned in chapter 3? He only worked in another place. Okay, now that's that's the chapter and um, it's... We needed to read the whole thing to get the feel of it. Let me show you something about the structure of Daniel chapter 2 through to 7. 2 through to 7. Chapter 1 is an introduction and then 2 to 7 is carefully structured. The theologians call it a chiastic structure. I prefer to call it a sandwich. Uh, Here we go. Chapters 2 and chapter 7 are parallel to each other. They are both about a vision of the future and a mention of four kingdoms. Okay, two and seven, you see in the diagram. And then three and six are parallel to each other. They're both about persecution and rescue. Chapter three, the fiery furnace. Chapter six, the lion's den. And then chapters four and five um, are parallel, and that is it's God's judgment on proud rulers, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. And I think really the structure is is to focus on how God rules over even these proud kings. Chapter 4 has a positive ending, and we'll look at that next week. Chapter 5 ends in tears. 
but you can see the structure, how it's, it parallels. All right, let's have a look at uh, the dream, and chapters 2 and 7 are parallels with one another. So the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in this chapter starts with a head of gold and then uh, chest and arms of silver, another kingdom. Uh, the head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar, chest and arms of silver, another kingdom, belly and thigh of bronze, and then the legs and feet are of iron and clay. And during that kingdom, a rock not made with human hands comes through and knocks them down and grows to fill the world. Okay. Now, you must beware of people who take prophecies from the Bible and say we can plug them into history and um, uh, understand the nations of the world and predict the future and tell you what's going to happen. Be very careful about people like that. And that is exactly what I'm about to do. So be very careful. All right. Let's have a look and I'll show you how I think this prophecy or prediction in Daniel lines up uh, with the future. Okay. So, and uh, you'll see in the diagram, I've taken chapter 2 and chapter 7 and how they fit together. Okay. You've got the dream, the history and in chapter 2 and then the vision in chapter 7. Okay, verse 32 says, the head of the statue is made of gold, which stands for Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonian Empire lasted from about 600 BC to 539 BC, and that's represented by a lion in chapter 7. Then the chest and arms of silver uh, stands for the Medo-Persian Empire, which lasted from around 538, 39 to 330 BC, and represented by a bear with one side raised up in chapter 7. Then the next kingdom, its belly and thighs of bronze. Uh, Alexander the Great's army used bronze weapons, uh, etc. Um, Alexander's empire well, began in around 330 and it broke up. Alexander died early, but lasted until around 100 BC and represented in chapter 7 by a leopard with wings. The wings being just how quickly Alexander conquered the world. And then verse 33 the final, the fourth kingdom, its legs of iron um, and, or partly of iron and partly of baked clay, stands for the Roman Empire. Um, the fourth beast in chapter, in chapter 7 is the most terrible of all. The Roman Empire from maybe 100 BC through for a number of centuries. And notice it says iron and clay. It's the idea of it being divided. And the Roman Empire was desperately divided and if anyone had civil wars, it was the Romans. I just went to Wikipedia and there's 22 different civil wars or rebellions mentioned in the first century BC and massive civil wars around the end of the Republic between Caesar and Pompey and others in the 40s BC. Iron and clay, incredibly strong and yet divided. Now that's just the first century BC that continues. See, Daniel, Daniel's a controversial book. Why? Because Daniel claims, and I believe this because the Bible says it, Daniel claims to be written in the, in the 6th century BC, uh, partly about Daniel and partly written by Daniel. There are scholars who say, oh, well, it can't have been written in the 6th century BC because it predicts the future. It must have been written in the 2nd century BC. And we have... We have hard copy manuscripts from the second century BC. Um, but the reason to say that is, is not because of hard evidence, it's presuppositional. Alan Harmon has written a commentary on Daniel uh, where he goes through the arguments. Why do people say it has to be second century BC? He goes through the arguments. You could look that up later. And the only real argument is, oh, you can't have predictive prophecy. But I actually believe here is God who's shown us what, or showed Daniel and his friends, what it is that would happen. And what will happen, you see verse 44, we're told, in the time of those kings, that's the, the iron and clay kings, the Roman Empire, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end but it will itself endure forever. Now, that kingdom that God would set up during the Roman Empire, well, you know the story, don't you? About one third of the way through the first century, 
there's a young preacher from Galilee begins to preach to the crowds. And what does he say to them as he preaches? Well, really, it's in a backwater of the Roman Empire. Mark chapter 4, verse 1 tells us, Again, he began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. It's a big crowd, but it's small enough to be able to hear him without a PA system. And then he tells a story about something small growing huge and affecting the whole world. Mark chapter 4, verse 30, that same day he said, and he said, with what can I compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, the tiny, tiny seed, mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. What's Jesus saying? The kingdom of God will begin tiny and yet grow huge. Jesus said his kingdom is not of this world. What does he mean? It won't grow at the point of a sword like other movements have, but it would grow from a small beginning and grow huge. In fact, he said one day the kingdom of God would renew all of creation. There would be a judgment day and creation would be renewed. What does the kingdom of God mean? It's not a place or an institution. It's the idea of people knowing God through the rule of God's king or, if you like, the reign of God in people's lives through Jesus. And has the kingdom of God grown? Well, imagine how small it is, just a crowd of people who could hear him without a PA system, a handful of people after his resurrection, and now... Well, here's an interesting stat. The, the Gallup World Poll Organisation runs uh, polls through uh, 160 countries. They um, uh, survey people about their different religious beliefs. Uh, here's, here's one stat. They estimate across... This doesn't include China. They're not allowed to go into China. But they say nominal religious affiliation. There's 2.2 billion people say, yeah, we're Christian. Uh, now, what's that, about a third of the world's population? It's hard to know what that means. Uh, so they drilled down a little deeper and said, attending a place of worship in the last seven days, there's 1.1 billion people. Now, that's over a billion people who turn up in churches week by week. The kingdom of God is not the same as um, the church, but um, the kingdom of God is people who acknowledge the rule of Jesus. The church is the gathering of those people together into a community. But there's a billion people week by week who turn up and acknowledge Jesus as their Lord. What's the right reaction? Well, in verse 20, Daniel chapter 2, verse 20, Daniel and his friends respond to God revealing Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Do you see what they say? Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. What are they saying? They're celebrating the fact that their God, the God of the Bible, is the one who controls history. He's also the one who gives wisdom and discernment. And you know what? The more that if you belong to Jesus, the more that you're able to embrace that, the more you can face the future with confidence, whether that be you know, just dealing with, with anxiety or understanding our priorities, what they should be. It's there. God is the one who gives knowledge and discernment. And I couldn't help but think as I, as I looked at this, this chapter you know, we don't know what will happen in the next six months. Our politicians, our leaders are doing their best and they're doing a good job. But they say, we don't know what will happen in the next six months, which is what, 26 weeks? And yet here is the book of Daniel from 26 centuries ago telling us what would happen in history and what, how the kingdom of God will grow and ultimately what the future is. 
If you belong to Jesus, if you're part of his kingdom, you know God has the world in his hands and God has your life in his hands. There's nothing to worry about. Will you pray with me? Our Father, please help us to see your kingdom, to value and to treasure your rule in our lives and to seek that rule in the lives of others as well. Please have mercy on our nation. Use these chaotic times to open people's hearts and minds to know Jesus as their king. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, that brings our time together today to a bit of a close. Uh, we hope that you can come back again next week. If you're not joining in with someone else to watch this at, uh, at their home in a smaller group, uh, we would love you to jump on the Zoom groups using the groups link at the top of the screen. Uh, if you would like to have a bit of a chat and say hello to someone, um, or if you're new, that would be great for you to do. Otherwise, I hope that you go out into the week remembering what we've heard today from Daniel chapter 2, that there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. I hope you have a great week. See you later.